Hello, welcome to our talk. Uh, talk today uh, by myself, Mary Gugleski, and Fabio Tiritico. Today is an interesting emerging topic presentation called Retrofit Your Legacy Java App with a Reactive Flow Pipeline. We'll take a look at how reactive can be applied to transforming an old traditional legacy Java app. And this is our agenda for today. We'll have a quick introduction and then we'll go into talking a bit too about uh, a bit of history as kind of give setting up the stage as to why uh, we have this talk discussing from the perspective from uh, an, an enterprise JVM applications point of view. And then we also explore into a bit of the complex problems uh, in today's world that's evolving, that's becoming more and more complicated, needing more and more data. Uh, everything is just come in bulk. Uh, we have so much to sort through. So what would be a good approach is the, what we're proposing here, which is the fourth section is about uh, some solutions that we can be using. Use, uh, and it's basically leveraging on the reactive approach. And then Fabio will then take us into an in-depth uh, look into an experiment that uh, we have done and mostly merits to uh, Fabio who spent a significant amount of time uh, working through some of the <laughs> inner things. And so that will be Fabio um, area. He will spend more time with you on that. And then after that, yep. we will come together and give a conclusion to this whole experiment um, on the reactive Java ex kind of experience that we have. So, all right, so let's begin. A quick introduction. I'll just give my, since I'm talking, let me introduce myself. I'm Mary Grigleski. That's my Twitter handle. And I'm a senior developer advocate at IBM in the Java open source and cloud space. I'm also by night uh, president of the Chicago Java Users Group as well as, well as a few other user groups um, in the Chicago area. So now um, to you, Fabio. <laughs> yes, uh, hi everybody um, and thanks for having us. Um, my name is Fabio Tiritico and Twitter handle is TicoFab. It's a lot easier to pronounce than my family name. And uh, I am based in Amsterdam where I work as a uh, software engineer, now currently actually in an uh, engineering uh, manager position. And I am the founder of this community, Reactive Amsterdam. Um, so yes, the topics of today's talk are uh, really, really dear to my heart. Thank and, you, Fabio. Uh, so with that, for, without further ado, I'm gonna start. So why, right? And I. I've been speaking at a lot of conferences and so has uh, Fabio with a um, deeper experience in reactive too. And I'm sure, you know, Fabio too, like myself, we've constantly been asked by our audience as to, well, how can reactive be of use in today's world? So one aspect that we have been exploring into is really uh, looking into enterprise JVM applications. These are applications that are powering the, the world's you know, huge um, uh, kind of backend applications uh, in production, in big financial places, in insurance company, in um, manufacturing places, and you name it, that they are there. So they, their mission is actually very important uh, for the company. They do a lot of things on, for example, very typical ones is like e-commerce systems that um, essentially you have, you have customers trying to shop for something, catalog, and then, uh, then you order to order, as we all know, is not a simple thing. And, uh, and then of course, with this order and with today's world, we are not just paying by cash and we are also doing credit card or now um, even more like, you know, kind of a, what cashless uh, payment or what cardless payment, I'm sorry. And so all these things, they are very complicated and require a lot of security and all these things. And as you can see, is this is really complicated. And, but the traditional way of doing things is that before um, hardware has been able to get caught up, um, when we're having single CPU or having like parallel processing of multiple CPUs, but essentially, um, 
kind of uh, you know like a single thread handling uh, per CPU type of scenario. Um, applications were developed in a very monolithic fashion. Um, so everything too we could be processing is all in the same JVM, taking Java. And they are all like doing things within the JVM, um, let's say order entry. And if you have an order, you need to talk to uh, send uh, your order over to your credit card, verify all your transaction. They will actually essentially hold up a thread and you just like have to sit there and wait. And that type of, it's just an example of some of these monolithic applications in their runtime, uh, the, the effect of how it affects the whole system is just not designed to be very scalable, not very flexible at all. And not only that, you know, on the, the design side, um, we run into that problem in runtime. But the thing is too, is that we also rely on a huge operation teams to help us too with the building part, not, not only building in, the testing phase too, we will be like having, um, you know, the, a different uh, development uh, version of your co code or have your QA uh, running a separate version. And then you have certifying all that before you go into production. Then, so overall too, the maintenance of such application is, is very high. And it's also not very flexible. It almost seems like the world must stop if you need to upgrade any part of the system. And that's kind of like the whole kind of uh, issue with it. And uh, of course, too, the data aspect too, you know, is kind of like um, hard for it to be um, kind of like go through different states uh, without being easily able to get updated the state changes between these, these different parts. So such a list go on. And of course, too, not to mention uh, the fact is that uh, there's also the concurrency aspect of processing that, that present itself a lot of challenges. So those are kind of like some of the traditional enterprise applications uh, that, that uh, we can kind of think of using a, a reactive approach to solve. Then we talk about the solutions uh, that, that, uh, that uh, we're proposing is to use this reactive approach is that um, in today's world, then of course it's microservices have, has already been uh, popular in the, you know, since I'd say in the 2010s kind of timeframe. And so those are solutions of uh, using this reactive approach and actually microservices itself too is, is kind of perfect for um, letting the reactive or, or be adopted by the reactive uh, way. They kind of both are kind of uh, work together very well. A reactive system itself is by nature uh, not tightly coupled to um, so microservices is like a perfect kind of architectural uh, approach that reactive systems can use. Oh, actually, I should also add too is like also the serverless aspect too. It, it deals with the deployment part too, and and in the serverless cloud native world too, um, it's also very suited for this reactive approach. Um, and, uh, and of course, too, uh, with microservices, everything kind of broken out and not lo no longer like, you know, all together, then you can essentially uh, do your upgrading without one part can be down while other parts are still running. So that kind of uh, is, is very, very uh, conducive uh, for the reactive approach. Um, and of course, too, um, there's also uh, the traditional operations part is no longer you know, the, the case we're kind of using modern uh, DevOps and infrastructure to uh, for the deployment building, continuous integration uh, and uh, deployment part. Um, and now too, if you think of uh, reactive too, is basically enable uh, concurrency without us, uh, the developers still having to worry about the mechanics of threading concern because all of the threadings are now being handled by the libraries by the reactive framework or libraries or toolkits so that uh, developers can then uh, focus on actually the business operational side. Now, the thing is with using reactive approach is basically what we're proposing is to build and transform some legacy um, applications where identify, ident identifying parts of it and allowing the data to be flowing through different pipelines. And that's the uh, area that, uh, Fabio will be demonstrating for us is to uh, a, a case in which we are building 
using different implementation of a reactive pipe pipeline and different implementation, different reactive libraries to implement this pipeline. And uh, so, yeah, so I will pass the baton over to Fabio to talk about uh, this particular use case. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mary. Um, what we are going to look at is this, this hypothetical situation where um, we, we're talking about some data pipeline and, and there's gonna be some processing happening. Um, the first uh, legacy processor uh, will read, consume data from the first Kafka topic. And then the second processor will do some additional processing on it after uh, it has received the output of the first processor. And finally, uh, the second Kafka topic will be where the, our process data will end up. And what's important is in this entire pipeline, we are using concepts coming from the reactive streams idea where um, you know, reactive streams is a standard that has been part of the JDK since uh, JDK 9, I believe. And, uh, and one of the most important uh, uh, consequences and benefits of, this, of using this, this standard is, uh, is, is back pressure. So what we'll see is that uh, the, the entire process only does actual something if there is demand from downstream. So in this concrete example, let's say if the legacy processor number two doesn't have enough capacity to process all the potential incoming data, uh, the, the first processor, legacy processor number one, will be reacting to this situation by simply stop sending data and awaiting for legacy processor to be ready to process more more information. And this is crucial in large systems where many, many pieces interact with one another as uh, you know, fast producers might well you know, uh, boggle down uh, slow consumers. And so in order to avoid this sort of uh, overflowing situation, uh, we have these pipelines that employ uh, back pressure all the way up to the source of the data. And now let's go look at some code and some demo. Uh, here we are, you should be seeing my screen now. And uh, what you are seeing now is in fact, the GitHub repository with the code for the demo that you're about to see. Um, as you can see, there's uh, these two legacy processor one and legacy processor two are our uh, projects. Um, and then there's two other folders. One is about infra, it's a simple Docker Compose file that will spin up our uh, you know, Kafka infrastructure. And sources producer is a project that will simply uh, put, put some, some random data on Kafka. So the first legacy processor has something to consume. Now let's see this in action. Um, here we are, uh, there's our infra uh, directory. Let's spin up our infrastructure. This is going to start our entire Kafka backend. Yeah, there it is. Now we have a run Kafka cluster on my local machine. And so let me start the sources provider, which will start uh, push uh, data into our Kafka topic. This is going to be just, let's see, there it is. One record per second uh, containing just that specific timestamp, as you can see. And this guy is just going to keep producing as, as we go. Um, so let's uh, first look a little bit at the code before we started. What you are seeing now on screen is a, uh, the first, the implementation, the actual starting point of the first legacy processor. Um, it's in Scala. 
and it uses a reactive stream implementation called ACA streams. ACA streams is based on ACA, a product from Lightband, an open source product from Lightband. And the idea of ACA streams is uh, to that implements in the, the, the reactive stream specification. So um, there are a lot of different connectors that we can use uh, in uh, as part of ACA streams. In particular, here we are going to use the connector that allows us to connect to a Kafka topic and consume events from it. And the see this 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 little snippet here. This is the entire thing, the whole thing that we really need to look at. What this processor is going to do is going to okay after instantiating some configuration setting like which topic we are going to submit to to listen to. Here we are creating our stream, which starts considering our Kafka topic as a source of items. And then for each item that comes in, we are first simulating some processing. In this case, we are just extracting the string value and then a little, uh, an, a little uh, step here to convert the string into bytes. And then we are going to put this data into, I, into a R socket sync. Now, a little introduction to R socket is necessary here. R socket is a protocol alternative to HTTP. So at the same level in the, you know, it's an application level protocol, um, basically built with the reactive stream concepts in mind. So there are solutions that uh, leverage the reactive streams idea into HTTP, making it a uh, back pressure enabled uh, transmission of data across services, but our socket is born with it. And uh, this, is, this is all you need to know uh, really for now, but our socket is really an, uh, an interesting uh, project. In fact, our socket stems from reactive socket. That, that, that's what it was called in the beginning. And um, you know it's it's above TCP, so it really it makes a good candidate for two inter intercommunication between two services. And in this case, uh, this legacy processor one, what we have done is let's say this process item function method here represents a uh, legacy uh, uh, type of processing. Maybe we are dealing with indeed some legacy logic that we have and we don't want to change them. All we want to do is wrap it inside a stream. And then the data that comes out of it, we are going to offer to this R socket sync. It's a, uh, we are going to look at the implementation of this a little bit later. If we look for a second at the second legacy processor, which you are seeing on my screen, um, this is a Java application, which again, um, it uh, will create a Kafka producer in this case, because the output is producing data onto a second Kafka topic. And then this code that you see here is about, let's say this block here is about creating a uh, R socket receiver. So once the first legacy processor finds uh, a valid connection to the, to the receiver, it will start pushing data through. And what happens with the data that we receive is, is right here, is this bit. Um, for each uh, item that we receive from the first uh, legacy processor, we are going to extract its string content and simulate some work. This is again, simulation of some legacy processing logic. Um, uh, this processing actually is maybe a little interesting to look at, it's just down here. Um, it will basically make our machine, and our thread slip for a random number of seconds. Uh, we'll see uh, later why a random. And, uh, and after we are done processing, we are going to publish the data 
on to a second Kafka topic. What's interesting, oops, what's interesting to notice here is that when only at the moment when we return from this method, once the execution of this logic highlighted now as completed, this is going to be the signal to the first legacy processor that we are ready to receive more data. And this syntax here, flux.empty, you are probably familiar with it if you have used the project reactor or um, Spring Boot, uh, uh, Spring Boot-esque applications, you are probably familiar with this logic. Um, and, and this is all I want to say for the moment about this legacy processor. Um, let's try and give these two guys a spin in this window here. So let me first start. Let me just check that the, yes, our, our uh, sources producer is still producing data on Kafka. So let's spin up our uh, first legacy processor. Now, this processor has started and is trying to connect to a R socket receiver, but at the moment there's none running. So what's interesting already to notice is that because there is no uh, server running, then this entire stream is not consuming anything because this particular component is not asking for anything to consume. So by going all the way back to the source, we are not consuming anything from Kafka. This consumption will start when we trigger the second uh, legacy processor. What we should see, if the demo gods help us, is that the, this, the first legacy processor will connect to the listener and start consuming events from Kafka. There it is. So here, what you could see is that when an item re is received on the second processor, then there is this random delay. So you see two seconds, uh, three seconds, and the first processor is only reading messages from Kafka as there is availability from the second processor. And so you see that they really go hand in hand. The entire thing is, is uh, protected in this sense. We are only consuming data when there is some need for it. Um, and I just want to, this, this concludes our demo. I just want mm -hmm. to spend one more minute for those of you familiar with uh, Akka streams. It's, it's an incredibly powerful ecosystem incredibly rich. There are Kafka connectors, HTTP connectors, or connectors um, to connect to basically most of your uh, potential technology underneath uh, in a reactive way. Uh, but interestingly enough, there isn't an official uh, connector for our socket. So what I have done, um, I have created these two R socket sync and sources. Um, get an inspiration. There is a blog post actually on the Lightman website, which I used as a um, inspiration and, and then built on top of that. This code you see here is, a R, is the R socket sync that we are using. And the idea is um, this is the uh, area where we create the, uh, the connection to the R socket receiver. And then um, what I want you to look at is basically two things. This method here that we have overridden on push um, lets us write the logic of when we should retrieve items from the stream and when we should get then the next one. Um, 
so in this case, this grab is a uh, is the signal to grab an item from upstream, and then only uh, so we are grabbing some payload here. Here, this is the line where we are sending the payload further, and then only when there is a request, we are asking for a new item that will be triggered from above. Um, and the, the code is online, so you can look at it. Um, this is all for our little demo. And now I would like to share with you a couple of conclusions about this experience from building this pipeline. So the good things and the bad things I found. Uh, well, first of all, I have some experience with reactive streams already, but if you haven't uh, been exposed to them, to this kind of a standard, it really is incredible. It, it enables you to work with different technologies. Uh, not only on the JVM, you could uh, have a reactive stream uh, implementation in Python, for instance, why not? And, and, and still keep the streaming semantics of back pressure all the way through the pipeline. But something that is not great is that different implementations, as you can see, are not yet very easy to get to work together in the same process. Uh, our socket is a great technology, but unfortunately, documentation is very limited. Um, I asked uh, some things online and I got help from the uh, helpful contributors, uh, but mostly pointing to the examples online which are certainly useful, but then again, limited. And you have to do a lot of work to figure things out as you go. Um, I, also, I also didn't like very much that the Java implementation relies on Project Reactor um, because uh, you might simply not want that. You might want to use a different implementation. And if you are in the spring sort of world, this is perfect, this is absolutely perfect for you. It will just, mix seamlessly with Spring Boot. In fact, there's uh, books written about it. Uh, but if you don't uh, particularly like Project Reactor, you're still stuck with it. So it's you know just a dependency. In fact, my conclusion is that, in fact, while not built for this streaming purpose, if you mix HTTP with, the, with some underlying streaming semantics, and there are some projects that have done that, like Aka HTTP. Well, this solution might be a more efficient and faster way for you to modernize your legacy application. And um, this is uh, all for me. And maybe we can have some share some conclusion together with Mary at this point. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Fabio. It's a great uh, demo and and very clearly explains thank you so yeah and um yeah we we're kind of looking at this whole pipeline and we we're wondering yeah this is like a sample uh implementation could we actually have uh other implementations i think as you mentioned about right we could actually write maybe the legacy processor too could be like in python in even javascript maybe node.js um, for sure and, uh, so I think it, it basically we're trying to illustrate this that with the reactive streams uh, kind of approach, it's it's actually uh, make your application a lot more uh, module, so to speak, like modularize. Uh, if you're Correct. writing microservices, you can actually have the legacy processor as one microservice and the other legacy processor is another one. And so you can see that they all connect with each other through messaging. And in this case, we, as Fabio has illustrated, it will be in our socket and you can plug different things in plug and play. So it, it's actually a, a very flexible approach. And that's what we also like about our uh, reactive. And it's because of that capability that kind of enables us to do things more efficiently too. Indeed. So, yeah, yeah, yep. exactly. Indeed. So yeah. Yeah, and then also maybe one last kind of conclusion is that, well, how about like Project Loom that's kind of scheduled now for Java 18, I believe. And that's right. So there's still a couple more versions before it will be released. But we wonder, right, with virtual threads, uh, carrier threads too, right? And 
we wonder how you know how it would be and there i've all also like heard about people talking about oh project looms coming out reactive's gonna be dead and but i really yeah. i don't think so right i mean how can i mean reactive so to speak we're handling uh the problem domain on a different level on a more abstract level but uh the virtual threads are a bit more of the lower level dealing with more of the uh towards more of the primitive kind of more threading kind of um, that that direction. So then it's more like they, exactly. they both should be complementing each other is what I'm thinking. Exactly. I fully agree. I think um, Project Loom is definitely going to be a very, very powerful uh, addition to the JVM. Um, in my personal uh, opinion, I think is going to be very useful for low level uh logic so maybe if you are a library maintainer or uh well maybe if you're the maintainer of one of these reactive library yourself yes. this is going to be really really useful okay. but for a lot of users you know simple simple users um, of these libraries yeah. i think we will still prefer to operate at a higher level than you know going back to uh creating and spinning up threads ourselves even if they're virtual we'll see um we'll see how it plays out but yeah certainly something to definitely keep keep an eye on yeah very true yeah wonderful yeah it's been a great uh conversation too in our presentation hope everybody enjoys it and uh, yeah these yeah. are a couple of links to uh, lots of things we've mentioned uh, the first one is uh, the sample code that i've shown you um our socket quarkus docker lots of technologies that we mentioned and i believe this is uh, all for from us so uh, thank you very much these are our uh, contacts and our and our links that's right yeah thank you all for attending our talk thank you mary and fabio uh there's there's a question um how are errors managed between the r socket producer and receiver uh, acknowledgement, for instance, um, what's happening if do some processing fails and flux.empty is not reached in the second legacy system? Yeah, so um, hi, everybody. I hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, no problem. Thanks for attending our talk. Um, and yes, very good question. What happens there? Um, I think um, if, you, if you hang that thing forever, uh, because of some reason, and that flux that empty line is never triggered, then the entire chain will simply hang forever. So it is really up to you to make sure that eventually you have a timeout or uh, you're you're resilient in that sense. Um, I would imagine that if the if the entire process crashes, um, then the the other side uh, wouldn't get a reply to that. So probably there needs to be some time out there, some time out there as well. Um, but yeah, this is I think it's it's really about your business logic. Uh, 